welcome back to the analyst of Aji Raman Ravi. Today is 17th of November and what are the important articles that we shall be covering today? Let's have a look. In the first article, we will learn about the different international laws and regulations regarding maritime trade and maritime security as recently highlighted by the Defence Minister while he was attending an ASEAN conference. Next, we will read about the issues which are prevalent in Indian media as highlighted by a vice president and what is the need of enforcing media ethics. Next, we will read about the prospects of e-pharmacy in India and what is the viability therein. Next, we will read about a paramilitary force that is Assam Rifles. And from prelims point of view, we will be covering mapping. Mapping of two conflict-ridden regions, one is the Haiti and second is Cyprus. So, let's get started. The first article talks about maritime trade and the need of maritime security, especially in the Indian Ocean region. What is the context? The context is our Defence Minister Rajnath Singh attending the Asian Defence Ministers Meeting Summit in Jakarta, Indonesia because it is led by Indonesia this year. So what is ADMM plus? So this is a regional grouping of the 10 Asian nations along with their dialogue partner and India as we know has become a dialogue partner in the year 1992. So India has also participated in this summit. Now the summit initially started from 2010 and this is when we are seeing that a lot of defense ministers across these dialogue partners and the member nations are coming together to discuss the regional security architecture in the Indian Ocean region. This particular topic is very very important because it has got its coherence in two parts of the syllabus in GS2 as well as in GS3 and UPSC is nowadays getting into a habit of asking questions which are pertaining to multiple sections multiple sides of the syllabus so therefore pay kind attention to it now when we talk about maritime trade and maritime security it is very crucial for overall prosperity of a nation a region and overall international economic growth therefore the key principle on which it works is to ensure that our maritime trade is open, that is, the, it's free of barriers, it is inclusive without any restrictions or unreasonable restrictions, so to say, and should be free. So, on the basis of these three key principles, there are multiple laws and regulations that have been formulated across the world in order to ensure or in order to harmonize the laws according to in accordance to with the maritime trade will be done or the maritime security will be ensured and a pioneer law in this regard is the UN clause the United Nations Convention on the laws of sea that is basically an international agreement uh, many countries have came together and signed on an agreement to create a legal framework this legal framework ensures how the maritime trade will be conducted and UN clause was signed UN clause was officially signed or it got enforced in the year 1982. Now UPSC has of late been asking a lot of questions from UN clause and similar treaties which are ensuring maritime trade and security. So therefore this topic is not only important from mains point of view but also for the prelims point of view. To begin with it, UN clause started defining the regulations by having a differential legal status given to different maritime territories. Now the entire maritime territory across a sovereign state is divided into five broad maritime zones. These zones are divided officially by UN clause and they are subjected to differential regulations. That is the control of the autonomous state or the sovereign state on these maritime boundaries. It differentiates, it keeps changing as they move away from the baseline. So first of all, the first concept, what is a baseline? Baseline is that low tide line in which the low water level prevails. So for example, this is the territory of India and here is where the low tide line falls. So this will be considered as the baseline for India and all the further subsequent maritime zones will be calculated from this baseline distance. So this is considered as zero kilometers. And now the regulations across the maritime zone starts. So 
you need to understand there are two kinds of water there are internal waters and external water so all the water that is coming inside the baseline all the seas that are coming inside the baseline for example your chilika lake it is inside the baseline so this is considered as an inland water and the regulations are completely given to the state this for example in the case of chilika lake the odisha state will be completely uh, having the sovereign rights over the internal water then there are archipelagic waters there are certain group of major islands which are called the archipelagos for example indonesia so in 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 countries like that there are archipelagic waters in which there should be a baseline and un clauses set a set standard for this that you can extend the archipelagic baseline as much as you want but it should be limited to a maximum length of 125 nautical miles of baseline that means the diameter shouldn't be more than 125 nautical miles from the islands especially from the major islands of the archipelago once we have understood these basic concepts of baseline internal water and archipelagic water now let's go into dive let's dive into the maritime zones now the first maritime zone is the territorial sea the territorial sea is where the baseline extends up to 12 nautical miles so the distance from your baseline till 12 nautical miles is considered as a space where the sky or the right to flight the surfacial waters the right on the subsoil or on the seabed all of them are accorded to the coastal state so the sovereign right is ultimately of the coastal state but here is where there is no right to innocent passage a ship that is coming unwarranted a ship that is coming from an external state is not allowed to passage freely through this territorial zone it is completely sovereigned by the by the coastal state next is the transition zone transition zone between the territorial water and the high seas high seas which extends beyond the exclusive economic zone so this transition zone will dilute the powers of state so as you go as you move away from the baseline the control of the state over the maritime boundary gets diluted further so in the territorial boundary in the territorial seas it will be having maximum sovereignty maximum control then it will dilute further in the in the contagious zone or in the contiguous zone now this contiguous zone extends up to 12 nautical mile from the baseline this is the contiguous zone this is still here we have contiguous zone and here is where the state is having some of the rights but only on the surface water and on the sea level bed not on the flight not on the uh, basically or air next is the exclusive economic zone now this is where this is the widest maritime zone which extends up to 200 nautical miles and region beyond this is considered as high seas and high seas are those areas which are considered as a common inheritance of mankind because no regulation of no state is applied over here but let's come back to exclusive economic zone a very unique zone where innocent passage is allowed of any any ship or any carrier ways coming from external places but here the the right or the power of the coastal state is heavily diluted now we have only control over the mineral wealth that is lying in the sea floor so we do not have sovereign rights over the over the sea surface and obviously on the uh, aerial surface or on the aerial levels we only have right on the bed surfaces now here is where the energy production can also be carried out here is where there is no restriction on passages whatsoever so there is complete right to passage so these are some of the maritime transition zones or maritime zones that were designated by the un clause having separate legal status accorded to them now once we have understood about the different maritime zones let's talk about the importance of ensuring maritime trade and security for india the importance lies in the extravagant significance significance in the terms of region in the terms of expanse see india has got more than 1200 islands underlying in the indian ocean it has got a coastline more than 7500 kilometers and has got your exclusive economic zone expanding or expansing to more than 20 lakh square kilometers so therefore we are holding a lot of mineral wealth biodiversity wealth and what not energy wealth as well we do not want to lose hold of it so therefore we want to make sure that there is free inclusive open trade and we also get the accessibility of resources while also ensuring that the other countries are also getting it also maintaining the overall security in the indian ocean region so first importance is because we have a huge territory underlying second is 
our dependence on the maritime economy. A lot of nations, a lot of coastal states are dependent on the blue economy, which holds a lot of potential. And then India also has second rank in the world after China in the amount of fish production. Then there is also vast amount of polymetallic nodules in underlying in the central Asia, in the central Indian Ocean seabed. So we are also having a lot of economic wealth as when we talk about in when we talk about the Indian Ocean. Then there is huge dependence on the maritime transport because the sea lines of the ocean, the sea lanes that are underlying in the or the traditional maritime routes in the Indian Ocean region are responsible for carrying out 70% of the total value of the exports of India and about 95% of the total volume. So ensuring their safety, security, inclusivity is very important, very crucial for India. But then lies certain challenges which India and the other countries of Indian Ocean region needs to acknowledge. First is the limited capacity, not just of India, but of the other nations. But when we talk about India in particular, we are spending very less as compared to what other countries like US and China have been expending on their naval capabilities. As a result of this, we have compromised infrastructure, we have limited number of bases, limited connectivity. Therefore, the transports, the logistics, all of these are are, are uh, compromised and India is not able to materialize its full economic wealth so far. Next is the growing militarization of the Indian Ocean region because this is a very strategic location of the world now. So people are seeing this as the new heartland, the new rimland. So you can see from here, from this particular map that you will see a lot of a lot of countries, especially China, acquiring military ports across different countries that are surrounding the rim of Indian Ocean. For example, the Gwadar port of Pakistan, the Djibouti port of the Horn of Africa, the Humban Dota port of Sri Lanka, so on and so forth. India has got limited bases, limited naval capacity. So therefore, we need to ensure that there are checks and balances so that we can counter the over-militarization from a particular country in the Indian Ocean region in order to safeguard it. Next is a growing menace of a non-traditional threat. This is illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. So in a previous session of analysts, we have read about the dark shipping. That dark shipping is when the ships violate the laws or the provisions of carrying a GPS tag with them. They either switch off this GPS tag or they make it defunct. As a result of this, they are not, they are not regulated. They are not tracked well and therefore they are able to create it, it it creates a breeding ground for a lot of smuggling activities piracy activities so therefore illegal unreported and unregulated fishing is one of the biggest menace that the indian ocean region faces next is because of the iuu fishing or the dark fishing type we also see growth of maritime terrorism we also see growth of piracy Piracy especially, for example, the Somalian piracy or the Somalian pirates who are very infamous for this is seen prevalent or growing in the Indian Ocean region. And also maritime terrorism as we have seen that the 26-11 Mumbai terror attacks were actually routed through Arabian Sea because they were off guarded because they were carried out through dark ships. So therefore, this is also a growing challenge in the Indian Ocean region. Next is the rising Chinese dominance, their aggressive economic expansion, militarization, violation of UN clause laws, for example, their, uh, their violation in the, in the nine dash line in the South China Sea. And also they are trying to control the choke points. These are those crucial trade points that if they get choked, they will, they will stop the overall trade supply across the world. These are Strait of Malacca, Strait of Hormuz, Suz, Babel Mandeb, Sunda, Lombok, etc. So we need to make sure that there is a balance, checks and balance across these choke points so that a particular country does not dominate and ultimately try to usurp and block these choke points which will gravely impact the overall flow of oil and other imports and exports across the world. Now, what are certain international laws for maritime trade and security? First and foremost, the pioneer law of 1982, which is the UN clause. UN clause has provisions not just on the navigational routes, according uh, also on the maintenance of ships, but also it regulates 
the different zones provides differential laws legal status to different maritime zones as we have already read it also controls the international bed so it covers it's a very comprehensive agreement legal framework which all the countries have to follow but the only problem is that not every country is a party to it so we should ensure that there is a near universal membership in this next is imo it is a specialized organization of united nations headquartered in london and this ensures that the shipping is regulated via two essential conventions one is which regulates the safety of life at sea how does it do it it sets certain safety standards for the merchant ship how they should be constructed what are the safety standards of the equipment all of this is guarded by solas or international convention for the safety of life at sea and the second and the very important one is the marpole convention which is regarding the abatement or the prevention of pollution that is coming from ships so to prevent the pollution of the maritime environment by the ship this convention is also launched under IMO so this is very very important not just for mains but also for prelims point of view another question that has been asked in prelims in a statement was a UN convention against transnational organized crime so in order to counter the maritime terrorism United Nations under its various protocols has signed up Palermo convention also known as the United Nations convention against transnational organized crime now under this protocol the smuggling of the migrants by the land sea and air all the phases are controlled and regulated also it addresses organized crime which is not addressed by the by the above two uh, conventions if you can see and it also includes crime that may affect maritime security so this is a very unique law specifically dealing with the maritime security now there are certain regional agreements especially in the indian ocean region for example the formulation of jiboti code in the south of africa this ensures a regional architecture is set in place to counter the smuggling the piracy and the cases of security evasion in the indian ocean especially in the western indian ocean region this make this gives us a good case study as well and we should try to build more such regional codes in order to ensure that the maritime trade is propelled and security is taken care of now coming to the next question this is about media ethics so what is the context that our vice president has highlighted the need of ensuring media ethics in india while also highlighting some of the issues that are prevalent with indian media this is in context with gs paper number 4 and also very important for the essay paper now when we talk about media media is one of the most important and potent sources for information dissemination we all look back to journalism media in order to fetch information because we have trust in it we have trust in its authenticity there is a certain importance of media underlying across the world which makes it a very powerful tool of democracy this importance underlies in the fact that it forms the voice of the voiceless it ensures a kind of transactional democracy between the citizens and the government it ensures that citizens are well informed it is an agency of information right so it ensures that citizens are informed about the government policies their acts their regulations and whatever they are going about doing about in the nation so it helps to keep the citizens informed and at the same time it helps to ensure that the citizens grievances or their opinions are heard loud and well by the government agencies or by the people who are ruling them so it ensures that the voice of the voiceless are reaching to the people who are holding the powers second importance of journalism lies in the fact that it shapes the public perception whatever i and you think about our overall governance our overall administration is basically coming from the content consumption from media and now that we have different kinds of media especially the social media we are highly we are highly affected by or our perceptions are highly affected by how media portrays a particular personality or a particular propaganda or philosophy so therefore it is also becoming a very powerful tool especially with the commencement of the industrial revolution 4.2 that is ai next is it acts as the fourth pillar of democracy it is ens it ensures that there is certain checks maintained transparent checks are maintained on the other three pillars of the democracy that is the legislature the executive and the judiciary now these important features of journalisms are true but they are only true in the case of ethical journalism and not otherwise so what are the ethical principles that upholds 
द मीडिया एथिक्स और एफिशियंट ट्रांसपेरेंट रिस्पॉन्सिबल जर्नलिज्म दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम जी एस पॉइंट ऑफ जी एस फोर पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू द फर्स्ट प्रिंसिपल इज द एडियरेंस टू ट्रूथ एंड एक्यूरेसी द फर्स्ट कार्डिनल ट्रूथ द फर्स्ट कार्डिनल वैल्यू दैट मीडिया शुड एडेयर टू इज कंप्लाइंस टू ट्रूथ एंड दिस इट कैन एंश्योर बाई चेकिंग द एक्यूरेसी ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट दे आर पोस्टिंग therefore it will ensure that they are becoming responsible reporters as compared to sensational reporters so checking the authenticity should be the first and foremost principle the second should be to act independently they should not act under any formal or informal pressures or influences of any interest group for example a political group they should be giving impartial unbiased news so acting independently fearlessly courageously is very important these are some of the ethical values next is acting fairly and impartially so definitely acting in complete objectivity is it's not very feasible all the time but yes media can try to be impartial at most of the times where it is following non partisanship that is not aligning with a particular political view or affiliated group next is to do or to pursue the do no harm principle under this media should be mindful of the impact that the generated news is going to create in the society and what are going what are the harmful impacts that it's going to create so on so this is the next principle and last but not the least is to ensure accountability in a democracy that is of the people for the people and by the people only only people should be the one who are to whom everybody is accountable which means the media should hold itself accountable to the people it should also make the three organs or the three pillars of the democracy accountable to the people so that we can have a truly vibrant democracy now another kind of principle as given by gandhi ji is the principle of having social responsibility so in the words of gandhi ji to quote and quote the sole aim of journalism should be to provide services and by keeping in checks the excesses that can be performed by the media in the form of abuse of the power of misuse of the right that are given to them so gandhi ji says that newspaper is a great power and while acknowledging that he says that but just as an unchained torrent of water submerges the whole countryside and devastates the crop so as an uncontrolled pen serves but to destroy so therefore control ethical and responsible media which is holding up or holding up the social responsibility is very important to uphold the democracy of the day next is the underlying constitutional principle so as we know under article 19 section 1 sub section a we have been given the right to freedom of speech and expression which thereby guarantees the freedom of media but this freedom should be exercised in limited amount should be exercised very carefully but what happens when media diverges from these ethical principles or misuses the freedom that is given to it certain issues starts prevailing in the society the first one is the prevalence of yellow page journalism so media was supposed to present to us objective news news that is based on facts but nowadays what we are seeing that it's getting converted into paid news new forms are coming up like fake news and most importantly the sensational news the sensationalizing of a news is also known as the yellow page journalism now the prioritization of the media houses of diverging from objective reporting towards sensational reporting is what is one of the biggest menace that is occurring in the indian media and across the world right now there is undue glorism there is undue uh, sensationalizing for example a case was seen during sushant singh rajput case in 2020 a likewise case was seen in arushi talwar murder as well and in both of the cases it was seen that on the basis of conspiracy theories media was conducting its own media trials so on and so forth so the second issue is excessive ethical breaches for example irresponsible reporting which is leading to fake news also their affiliation with certain interest group like political parties leading to creation of paid news next is the biased reporting 
मीडिया वॉज नेवर सपोज टू फोर्स देयर ओपिनियन और गिव देयर ओपिनियन ऑन एन इशू मीडिया वॉज सपोज टू गिव यू द फैक्चुअल रिपोर्टिंग ऑफ वट एवर इवेंट हैपन एंड यू वॉज सपोज टू बिल्ड द ओपिनियन बट थिंग्स इज रिवर्स नाउ अट इज एंड नाउ मीडिया इज गिविंग देयर ओन ओपिनियन देयर ओन लाइकेबिलिटी एंड डिसलाइकेबिलिटी ऑफ अ पर्टिकुलर पॉलिटिकल पार्टी और डिसलाइक टूवर्ड्स एनी एनी पर्टिकुलर ग्रुप एंड एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ दिस द रिपोर्टिंग ऑफ द मीडिया इज इज constantly becoming more biased next is the lack of diversity in the coverage very often you'll see only in one page or so you will see the media talk about the economy of the india the employment of the india the, the unemployment scenario of the india or the inflation or the trade deficit of the india rather you will find more uh, more news about the personalities about the celebrities about the politicians and rather on their personal lives as compared to what is going on in, in indian economy and indian society so therefore there is major lack of diversity second is the tempering or rigging of the trps the trps are according to international standards are the watch time that a viewer is giving in one minute so the per minute watch time of a tv channel gives its trp and this is getting rigged rigged day by day by the news channels why because they want to solicit more number of views so that they can get more amount of profit so indian media nowadays is shifting towards being more profit oriented as compared to being more democracy oriented napoleon bonaparte has also famously said that four hostile newspapers are more to be feared than a thousand bayonets bayonets is a gun with a knife which is considered very very harmful weapon but he considers that four faulty media outlets are more dangerous than this so what can we do to reduce it what can we do to ensure or establish media ethics in indian journalism first and foremost we need to bring ethical reforms that should come from the media houses themselves for example the ngos like nbsa news broadcasting standard authority the editors guild of india and even the quasi judicial statutory body like the press council of india should take a lead form a forum a discussion and then think about the issues and so on the solutions a similar case study or a best practice that was already done in this manner was seen in usa in usa an american society of newspapers editor came together and in order to counter the yellow page journalism that was very prevalent over there and responsible for giving a lot of fake news they formed canons of journalism back in 1922 so this was a level of the advancement this economy had where it came to the responsible reporting the responsible journalism next is to impose reasonable restrictions on media yes we do have we have given the freedom of reporting to media under the uh, under article 19 but every right is again subjected to reasonable restrictions and reasonable responsibility so certain responsibility should be imposed upon the media so that we can ensure their responsible reporting next is to strengthen the existing regulatory agencies for example the pci while it is quasi judicial in nature while it can censure warn or ask for apology by the newspaper publications or the houses they cannot impose punitive penalties they cannot impose penalties on them it restricts their power so we need to enhance their power by providing them more punitive powers next is to ensure code of ethics and broadcasting standards as given already by the news broadcasting standard authority that it is effectively implemented and abided by because since this is an ngo it is not really able to put up or able to implement these standards so we need to make sure that these standards are also implemented across the media houses and last but not the least coming back to what gandhi ji said we should all have a sense of social responsibility while consuming the information by given by media by by creating their uh, correctness check or by their authenticity checking and also the social responsibility should be endowed upon the media themselves so that they do the accurate reporting on the basis of the cardinal virtue of truth and accountability coming to the third topic this is about e pharmacy in india so the news is that delhi high court yesterday granted 8 weeks to center as last opportunity to frame a policy on the online sale of medicines in india saying that this issue has been lingering around for so long and government must expedite the process so this calls upon us to understand what is e pharmacy in india and what are the regulations going on this is pertaining to gs2 part of the syllabus in gs3 
Interestingly, this can form a very potent question in your next mains paper and a question like this could be asked to you that what are the concerns associated with Indian pharmacy industry, the e-pharmacy industry and give suggestions to overcome those issues. So let's bring on the discussion. E-pharmacy is basically an online platform which provides for the sales of medicines both the prescribed medicines and the non-prescribed medicines. And this raises the entire concern around the debate of e-pharmacy in India. So first of all, how did e-pharmacy grow in first place? You must have heard about these apps like 1MG, PharmEasy, Practo, Apollo Life, etc. Are they really allowed in India or not? We don't know right now because we don't have proper regulations in place but we know for sure that they are growing at an enormous pace it all started from COVID-19 when the lockdown happened and there was a huge need for the doorstep delivery of the crucial medicines like crocines antibiotics etc so there started the upsurgence of these of these e-pharmacy companies in India and they have grown so much so that you can see their market capitalization size it is now standing at about 700 million as compared to the entire health tech sectors across India. Now, COVID-19 definitely generated the need, generated the demand, but it got, it got aggravated when the 2020 order of Ministry of Home Affairs said that they will be allowing the existing Indian pharmacies in India so that they can operate here and completely freely without any regulations. This now raises the associated concerns. First is the lack of proper regulations. It poses a great threat to the public health. Why? Because the drug that is given to you without any prescription, especially the kind of schedule edge drugs which are given, can be one of the reasons why students or why, why youngsters or why children especially can come into the trap of drug abuse. This can also cause huge damage to the public health of the nation. And this is also not allowed under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 and still these pharmacies are prevalent in the country. Okay, next is it also has a huge risk to the national security. Everything is getting operated online. The data is maintained online. So therefore, this online data is under high chances of being misused by the agents or by the criminal agents, which can also infuse some of the addictive medicines into the system. And therefore, this will again deteriorate the total public health of the nation. Now, what is the response from the end of the government and judiciary in order to regulate e-pharmacy till now? So the first and foremost regulation came in the form of 2018. This is not an imposed regulation, rather just a draft rules that were given by the Ministry of Health back in 2018. Fascinating thing about it is that it has been notified, it has been finalized, public discussions have already been conducted. But then it is still shoved into the cold storage because the matter was considered sensitive and no such rules have been formulated so now. So Indian pharmacy industry, the e-pharmacy the e industry of India is largely unregulated. Next, there were different orders from various courts. So there were judicial interventions as well in the form of judicial activism. So Delhi High Court in 2018 said that there should be a complete blanket ban on the online sale of drugs across the country. Multiple courts like the Bombay High Court, the Delhi High Court, the Chennai High Court, they all have said that we, there's a strong need to regulate the e-pharmacies of the country because a lot of petitions, a lot of PILs have been filed off late by the associations of doctors which have raised the concerns regarding the unregulated e-pharmacy and the further drug abuse in India. Then 172nd Parliamentary Standing Committee also came up with a suggestion that it is appalling that the e-pharmacy rules that were notified back in 2018 have not been formulated, have not been drafted yet, have not been introduced yet because it has been already drafted and also the health ministry has has given a show cause notice to all the biggies for example the amazon the apollo the net meds pharmacy etc because they have been selling some of the drugs without license which is also a crime in india so what are the closing remarks what can we do about it first of all the question that whether there should be a complete blanket ban on the indian pharmacy on the e-pharmacy of india is it viable the answer is no, because first of all, there is huge demand that is growing up. 
The huge demand is also because of the surging internet connectivity because everybody is having mobile phones. So there is mobile phone penetration. There are a lot many digital India led government initiatives and also there are rising investments in the telecommunication sector in the e-pharmacy sector which will eventually give a boost to the economic growth of the nation. Can we compromise with all of these just because we want to balance it out with certain with, with another thing which is the unlicensed or the unregulation or the unregulated aspect of e-pharmacy? No. We need to take a madhya mark or a middle path where we are trying to regulate the existing e-pharmacies without giving a complete blanket ban on them. So outright ban must be avoided. This is also, if we do the outright ban, this will also be against the government's intent of building a medical or a health digital infrastructure, which is one of the key pillars of driving India's long-term growth strategy. And we need to regulate, but not stifle the innovation or the new foreign investments or the new kind of uh, innovations in the startup sectors that are coming, because it is also helping the public health and also the economy of the country. And also, Efficient and legitimate functioning of the e-pharmacy is the absolute lean of the hour and this is the perfect way forward what we need. From prelims point of view, let's talk about a paramilitary force that is the Assam Rifles. The context is that a patrol of Assam Rifle has been targeted in Manipur and an attempted IED attack was claimed, uh, was uh, done on them as claimed by the People's Liberation Army of Manipur. Now, what are Assam's rifle? Assam's rifle are one of the many paramilitary forces. Paramilitary forces that which is responsible for ensuring internal security of the nation. The security which is responsible for the external for the external architecture is known as the military, and one which is responsible for ensuring inner security, internal security is known as paramilitary. And this is one among the paramilitary force with a dual role, a very unique body this is. So we will read about it. First, let's read about the background. So this is the oldest paramilitary force in India, which has seen its commencement since the colonial times. So initially, it was called the Kachar Levi. Kachar Levi is basically here, somewhere here in the Assam region. They were the tea estates, tea plantations were done. And in order to safeguard these tea plantations, a Kachar Levi or a police force was, in, was implanted over here. Eventually, the functions uh, enhanced. And as a result, this became the Assam Frontier Police, responsible for protecting the entire frontiers of the Assam region. Then it became Assam Military Police, responsible for also sa safeguarding it against any foreign or external security or invasions and then finally it became Assam Rifles in the year 1917. It's headquartered in Shillong, Meghalaya. Its motto is the friends of the hill people and the unique feature about it is the dual control and the dual functions and rules. First of all, let's talk about dual control. This is the only paramilitary in the uh, force in the country with a dual control structure. Why? Because the administration or the administrative control is under the Ministry of Home Affairs and the operational control is under the Ministry of Defense because this is controlled by the Indian Army. So it has got dual control. It is also called dual role or dual function because it is not only responsible for protecting the frontiers of Northeast from the internal security issues but also responsible for guarding the Indo-Myanmar border in the region. So it actually acts as both military force and paramilitary force. It also augments the functioning of Indian Army while trying to safeguard the internal security of the Northeast along with the Indo-Myanmar border. So this was about Assam Rifles, a paramilitary force, the oldest one in India. Coming to the last topic, we shall be doing mapping of two conflict-ridden regions. These are Haiti and Cy Cyprus. So Haiti is in news because UNSC has approved a multinational security mission which is not led by United Nations, this is led by Kenya to intervene in Haiti due to surge in the deadly gang violence. So an unrest in the form of gang violence is going on in Haiti. And then the second island nation that is Cyprus is in news because new investigations exposes the global financial secrets. And a lot of Indian names have also came to fore. So we will be reading about Haiti and Cyprus over here. Let's first talk about Haiti. So as you can see from this map, Hattie is located in between 
the northern atlantic ocean and the caribbean sea now let me give you a reminder that the island nation and the seas which are surrounding them are very important because upsc is now frequently asking questions on them so please pay attention to this haiti is between two seas first is the north atlantic uh, the north atlantic ocean and the caribbean sea now haiti is basically part of an island in fact it is half part of an island this entire island is known as the island of hispaniola geomorphologically haiti is a part of the greater antilles archipelago so if you see the caribbean islands they are broadly divided into two kinds of archipelago the first one is the greater antilles and in the lower side this is the lower antilles and haiti or this hispaniola island is a part of greater antilles archipelago what is the history so actually one of the commonalities between haiti and cyprus is that both of them are island nations which are completely from all the sides surrounded by ocean and the second one in fact haiti is surrounded is actually bordered from one side by the dominion republic and that we are going to read but eventually yes both of them are the island nations very important one both of them have got colonial rule history of colonial rule and both of them are somehow conflict ridden so these are some of the commonalities between the two when we talk about haiti it has got its history in 1492 this is when columbus decides to discover india and columbus eventually reaches the caribbean islands so columbus reaches somewhere over here if you see in this map columbus reaches somewhere over here in 1492 and he comes and the rule of spain starts in the entire archipelago but then the focus of the people the focus of the spanish government shifted from the small island and it shifted towards the other parts of the north and south america therefore this dilution of the focus or control of this land led to the invasion or the coming up of france and establishing their settlements in the western part of this archipelago therefore eventually we will see that the western part western part will be french ruled and the eastern part will be spain ruled this is also lead to a lot of wars and conflicts eventually the western part becomes haiti and the eastern part becomes a dominion republic now let's also study it geographically further what are the borders and neighbors of haiti so as i have told you it only borders one nation that is the dominion republic which is to the east side of it this is dominion republic and it also has got neighbors it doesn't share border with it it has got neighbors like jamaica it has also got neighbor like cuba so you can see cuba over here let me erase this so you can see cuba over here with no border sharing but it is one of the neighbor northwestern neighbor and jamaica from where usain bolt hails so jamaica is also one of the neighbor of haiti and all of these are the caribbean islands so caribbean island if you see haiti this one you will see that there are two kind of rules over here one is the spanish rule spanish colonial rule and second is the french colonial rule which we have seen how and when now a very interesting question comes up that while both of them belongs to the same island dominion republic is thriving a lot having a having a huge share in its economy as you can see that the total the total gdp is about 255 billion dollars when it comes to dominion republic but haiti is largely suffering what is the reason behind it the reason is some of the geographical factors so what happens there is a dividing mountain range between this island this dividing range is known as the cordillera of the central mountain range these cordilleras divide the dominion republic and the haiti so when the moisture laden winds come from the sea they start falling in this region in the region of dominion republic as a result of this it is very very fertile it is rich of forests minerals agricultural wealth whereas it causes drought or dryness in the western part that is in the haiti so first of all it is geographically challenged because of the this mountain barrier second is it is also region where a fault is very dominant now this fault 
underlies or this fault is known as the enriculo fault and this is so vibrant or this is so active that it has called, caused two great earthquakes in the region of Haiti due to which it has suffered economically a lot of times. Next region is the region of Cyprus. Cyprus belongs to the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, a completely aloof island nation which is which is in news or which is in conflict due to its strategic location. Initially, it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire, naturally by the Turkey, and then came the British, and the therefore the power play started. So in 1914, it was officially annexed by the British. Here lived two kinds of people. One, the Greeks, and second, the Turkish people. And meanwhile, the British came, and British started ruling, created a lot of conflict, divide and rule policy, so on and so forth. And eventually, British decided that this region is not where we want to rule. So, in 1960, they were announced there. They were announced this region as independent. And now comes the conflict, the communal conflict between the Turkish people and the Greece people. Now, as a result of this, a coup will be organized. The tussle goes between Greece and Turkey as to who will control the Cyprus region or who will control the Cyprus country. So therefore, a coup, a military coup was organized once by, by Greece and as a result of this, retaliated by the Turkey, Turkey invaded the northern part and now as you can see, there is a line which divides the Cyprus region into two parts. One is the Turkish Cypriot and the second is the southern part or the Greek Cypriot. So there are two parts. The southern one is known as the Republic of Cyprus with the capital Nicosia and the Turkish controlled Cyprus which was officially designated in, 19, in 1983 and Turkey is the only country which is internationally acknowledging this region as autonomous territory of it. Now there were uh, multiple communal violence naturally that happened between the Turkish controlled Cyprus and the Greek controlled Cyprus. So in order to do a peacemaking treaty, United Nations interfered and created and created a demilitarized buffer zone between them, which is known as Green Line. So this Green Line is now controlled by United Nations peacekeeping force in Cyprus. It has got about like 1000 members, 1000 peacekeep peacekeeping members along with India and eventually this is this is what Cyprus looks like right now it is divided with a green line and it is also ridden by a lot of communal conflicts so this was all about today's news thank you so much have a nice day